Well, hello everyone, Stakuyi here. And I'm Gabby. And welcome back to the podcast, my hoes. Welcome back to a very special episode once again, because at the end of the month, uh, especially with you know Christmas coming up and people are looking at gifts and all the kinds of crazy things that you can do, it is time for the book club pick of the month. The Chirp Book Audio Book Club pick. I'm messing up when I'm saying the whole thing. It's- you know exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. I do this like every month. You do. Um, this month's book is called A Distant Mirror. The Calamitous 14th Century? Yes, which I know you said that as a question here. I will say this from the beginning. Usually when it comes to a lot of these different history topics, I am the person that goes really in depth about all of this. But I have been exceptionally busy this past month. For anyone who is watching this on YouTube right now, who physically sees us, you've probably seen like there's been a lot of different content that's been going out. There's been a lot of different things that I've had to do. He's trying to get some time off for Christmas. And so as a result of that here, I've just been going into overdrive, creating things. And Gabby, Gabby over here is the one that was listening to the book, like literally weeks before I it was. It was a good book. I mean, it is a long book. I'm not going to lie to you, but it's so worth it. I think chapter three was my favorite because the entire time I'm like, what on earth is happening? And when they got into the religion. Yes. Yes. The religious the aspects. corruption of the religion and the lack of laws in the religion and just how the popes work, the papacy. Mm-hmm. It is a good listen. Yes. It's very interesting. I think I, it's totally I, worth it. It's like three or four bucks. It's absolutely worth the three or four bucks. I'm pretty sure it's three ninety nine. It's three ninety nine that is on sale this month. Worth I highly it. recommend you get it. There's going to be a link that is in the description. Get it. It's a very good thing. It helps support this podcast channel and you learn stuff. And it's the style of book that's similar to when we did the um, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on the name of it. But when we did the one that was on the uh, like Charles V and the Ottoman Empire and like the wars that were going on between the Habsburgs and them, it's told in the same kind of narrative history. You can have a book, you can have something that is teaching you something where it's almost like a textbook where it's just going through the information. But the way that this does is it tells it like a story that it's explaining it to you. And I love that. Yes, you're going to get some stuff that is a little bit crazy sounding. You're going to get some stuff that it's like you're it, 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 it's strung together in a narrative sense rather than is just a factual statement. But it's it's so good and it ties it all together. And I love it. The chapter on sumptuary laws. Oh, they're great. I love it. I love. I mean, when you think about it, though, I guess in today's day and age, there might be some form of sumptuary laws, but they're not like rigid. Like they won't search your house if you buy something that a nobleman. We're going to get into it. Oh, you did include some. Of course. I. Are you kidding me? We're talking about something here that are great. Of course, I I had to. Which part you included, because I listened to everything and I know you picked like the best parts for the book. And there were so many good parts. So I didn't know if it made the cut. Pretty much. We're rambling at this point because I. I, It's a good book. (laughs) My wife is fangirling pretty much as much, if not more than I am over certain aspects of it that are just so fun to talk about. I, 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 I will say that. The premise of this, this whole thing by Barbara Tuckman or Touchman is that this it, it all ties around the idea, uh, the thesis that what we had seen in the 14th century would really reflect what we would see in the 20th century, pretty much after the horrors of World War One, like the disease, the war, the social struggles, everything. And how it all we you see this in humans cycling this again and again and again in history. And I agree because history doesn't repeat itself. People just repeat the same stupid mistakes in different time periods with different scenarios. And it tends to happen. And you learn a little bit each time when it does. I I will start this by saying I fully agree that this is something that we see cycled again in history, even recently. Like, I remember I remember this in 2019. Do you all remember when um, there were all those the memes like, oh, man, you know, 100 years since World War One ended, the Spanish flu began. It's going to happen again. We're going to get a war. Then we're going to get a pandemic. And then lo and behold, we get covid. And then there was that whole thing that was happening with Iran at the time. People were saying, yeah, World War Three is about to break Are out. Are you forgetting Dude, about Ukraine? No, no. This is before that. And people because this is when the whole thing was happening. And people were talking about World War Three because everyone was saying like the draft was going oh, to occur. In 2020, we were at Disney Rem- World and remember? everyone was tweeting about World War Three. And I was like, what is happening? I'm at Disney right now. So that was the joke. People were talking like it is the pandemic. And then that. And then lo and behold, the whole thing happened with Russia and Ukraine. Can we stop? 
cycling through the exact same storylines. And then that the is economic not crashes, though. the bubbles and everything. And people were saying like, man, I really wish that I wasn't living through a historic time period right now. Well, people say that every time anything happens. Yes. It's just the fact that it's back to back to back to back. You seem to see this cycle like every hundred years or so where so, like a sequence of events are tied together that affect all this. It's really crazy. Everyone says that America is supposed to crumble soon because empires only last 200 years. Well, but it, it, I don't like that phrase because the thing is empires did in like the ancient sense because you'd see the same kind of degradation and corruption and all this other stuff. But in yeah, modern corruption, you yeah, yeah, but modern time periods are so different because it comes they're, they're, it's completely different ballgames for how they're organized and controlled. Because and, the international politics, at the very least, if you were not holding it together, they will kind of. And you're also talking it. about empires with strong leaders. Like there's the there's the issue. Democracies don't tend to do that. Yes, you'll see them change and problems and all different kinds of things that occur in them. But you're talking about a a, a, a point where if it was a monarchy, if it was a dictatorship, if it was anything like that. When you see a transition of power following a series of corrupt or ineffectual leaders, that is where you see the problems and things start to just crumble around them. The 14th century was very likely a significantly nastier time. Go figure. I mean, we're talking about stuff that is due to, you know, the uh, dark ages. Yeah. Well, I mean, I also don't like that phrase. Dark ages. I don't they like that dark. phrase. It's not. It's really not accurate. It's really not. There, there's oh, dark. Well, it was dark in a certain part, but other places were thriving. Mm -hmm. So it really you can't just actually now that I'm thinking about it, if you want to describe anything as the dark ages, the, this time frame that we're talking about, this hundred year period over the course of the, like the 14th century, arguably was an actual dark period, not only due to what was occurring here at the time with the with the social, political and other different events like the horrors of it. But also, this is when the earth started to cool. And that is actually one of the really big things that led to a lot of the series of problems you were getting. There was like a year in there that was known as the year without summer. Explain. Lots of rain, lots of clouds, no sunshine, very short, actual summer period. All the crops failed. Yeah. Yeah. And as a result of what happens there. So in a literal dark age, it leads to a lot of problems. But we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that because that leads to all of this. Gabby, what was you, you said? Your, what was your favorite part of the book? Was it the sumptuary laws? Was it going it into the stuff of the church? They were like. Oh, so anyone that so they actually listed how many fancy outfits you can have. So if you were like a merchant, you can have like three. If you're a noble, you can have like this many. And then this was to keep because they believe that if you spend, I'm I'm really excited because it's so fun. It's so if stupid. you spend money on luxury items, you weren't actually giving money to the church, mm -hmm. and the church wanted the money, obviously. So they set oh, all yeah. of these laws. Also, nobles were upset that merchants. Nobles were upset that merchants were actually able to afford fancy clothing. And because of this, they were like, okay, so merchants need to have less than these noble families. But the problem was the noble families actually had less money than yes. self-made merchants. Yes. And then there were raids. So they'd raid through. These laws did not stop people from spending their money, obviously. So there were raids that went through people's homes looking for the fine silks looking for the fine clothing the different colors that they weren't supposed to wear and just you know raided how did they get go to prison they didn't oh people would the people would go to prison but the bigger thing that would happen is the nobles and the lords and whatnot need money so you know they would have this stuff would be seized and you're you'd be fined you know similar to what would happen in a small town that uh it, that needs to get a certain quota of speeding tickets in order to get money for their uh, local community. So they go and, uh, you know, just send the cops out and uh, start pulling people over for speeding tickets so that they can get more revenue. They can do that. Do you remember when we covered that whole thing about that, uh, that small town in Tennessee where the people revolted against the government? Athens. Yeah, Athens. Yeah. You just remember it's kind of like that. That was a, that was a thing that people did in some places where there were incentives for the police to arrest people because they got like bonuses and stuff based off the number of people they were getting, like the number of crimes they stopped. So in some places they would just be basically inventing shit up that they would go and arrest people for. Interesting. Also, I just want to apologize if my voice sounds off. Um, I'm very sick. <laughs> 
And in this garage freezing. that we are recording in is 21 degrees right now. Yeah. 21 degrees Fahrenheit. For anyone that is in uh, Europe right now that may potentially be listening to this, that's like what? Negative five degrees Celsius? Negative four degrees Celsius? Somewhere around there? Yeah, yeah. I'm really cold and I'm really sick. So I'm very sorry. You're also not wearing a coat. So there's that to consider. I thought it would look weird if I wore it's, a it, giant it, coat. You are pretty. But we're we're getting we're getting a little bit off topic here. It's also cold in what is going on in this time period, which is actually a great segue for us to really jump into this. So this book, the focus of it, right, is the crisis of the late Middle Ages, which caused widespread suffering all across Europe in the 14th century. And we've given a little bit of a preview of this kind of already from what we were describing. But for anyone who doesn't understand what I'm talking about, let's really get into it. I, I will say this from the beginning. I did have a little bit of a difficult time choosing what to write about for this podcast because there was so much. The book is long. 28 it's, hours long. It's great, though. There's just so much information. So I wanted to kind of give a bit of an overview of everything that covers the, the meat of stuff without spoiling all the fun little details that are in there. So. What happens is that after a period of economic and demographic growth that coincided with the expansion of feudalism all across Europe, you know, things are developing. You have the classic medieval age. Europe then goes and enters into a bit of a depression that lasts from around the 13th to the 14th century, like the late 13th century going into the 14th century. The 14th and 15th centuries would essentially show a kind of desolate landscape at times in some places where everything was burned to the ground. People were starving. It was just a horrible time. And one of the most important effects of the late medieval crisis was this demographic decline. There were multiple factors that would lead to this. Of course, you know, you had war, you had famine, you had epidemics. Sound familiar? <laughs> And uh, 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 there was a lot of aftershocks that went into society because it wasn't just like a one and done thing. Each thing like a domino effect would lead into the next. And when you had war that was mixed into all of that, it would compound and exasperate and just make it so, so much worse. War would intensify all of the devastating effects of the epidemics and the famines and everything. Because although agricultural productivity had really increased in the high Middle Ages, like that period starting around the uh, like the beginning of the 13th century, like the end of the 12th century, population growth had reached a point that the population exceeded really the limits of what agriculture could do by 1300. People were not able to produce enough food to sustain the population. The land wasn't good enough. This is actually a problem that really going into the 19th century before the development of artificial fertilizers and like the the Haber-Bosch process. The earth had reached its limit pretty much. Haber-Bosch, the guy with the, you know, he saved humanity and also destroyed and chemical weapons. Yes, yes, <laughs> okay. yes. The gist is farmland literally wasn't producing enough. And there were several factors. The fact that the farmland was being exhausted of its natural minerals and everything that it would need in order to produce crops so that every year things were producing less and less. And also the fact that the climate shifted in the mid 1200s. So for anyone that may be confused about when they say, oh, global warming or any of this stuff, it's not accurate. I know a whole bunch of people. It's climate are, change. Yes, a whole bunch the of people are going to jump on me for saying changing. that. changing. It's not necessarily going to get warm everywhere. Some places are going to have harsh, uncharacteristic winters, and others would have boiling hot summers, and some places might have both. Whiplash. Yes, yes. So starting around the late 1200s, you saw a, the climate shift where average temperatures would begin to cool slightly at first, growing a little bit more over time. But it, it wasn't so severe. It's not like it entered into an ice age or anything like that. It wouldn't be like that. But the difference is when you have an agricultural society that everything is dependent upon the patterns of weather, there is a certain growth season where the one or two crops that you are primarily growing grow in that. What this means is that their growing season shortens less. There is less time for the crops to actually grow and develop. The patterns of rainfall changed dramatically. It now rained way more often, which you think, OK, well, that means that the crops are going to be watered. Less stuff is going to die, right? It's not like it's going to die in the summer heat. Yeah, 
but it also resulted in a significant increase in storms and floods that would destroy agricultural lands. Agriculture became pretty much unsustainable in across different swaths in northern Europe. So places that before could grow food, but it was more difficult to do so now basically became impossible because th- there was no growing season. Like we're talking going up into like far northern Europe, going up into Scandinavia. You basically couldn't do it. It just got really bad. And in the rest of Europe, like some of the best agricultural heartlands, such as in France, France has amazing agricultural land for growing crops. It is one of the perfect environments for it. The productivity of it dropped drastically. So soil exhaustion would compound with all of these climate problems because what they had developed this time, uh, what they had been using was three field uh, like kind of crop rotation. It wasn't the, fir- the, the full four field crop rotation that would become the standard later on. What they were using at the time was a three field system that would it had slowed the process of degradation and but generations of this intensive farming of producing the same crops had over time drained the soil of nutrients to the point that productivity really declined compared to the 1100s, like just a century or so, or like a century and a half, two centuries earlier. Farmers were getting significantly smaller harvests in comparison to the amount of seeds that they were sowing. And the most dramatic cases of soil exhaustion were on the newly settled marginal lands, which were cultivated specifically because the population was growing. So they needed new farmland. Now that new farmland was barely producing anything. The effect of that in total with declining productivity and the weather and everything was food shortages, massive food shortages in the best years. And during a bad year, famine. And I actually I one of the things I pulled up here because I made the note for here just so that anyone understands. So, Gabby, when we're talking about the three field crop rotation, this is what it's referring to. It, it's not getting different crops in each one. The The idea of it is that you have if you, let's say you have a community, the primary farmland is where they're growing wheat and rye. Those are like the two base cereals that are most commonly grown in the field next to it. There's nothing. It's life like fallow. So what happens is that after you grow your wheat and rye the next year, you leave it empty. You, you leave it empty. Yeah, it doesn't grow anything. It's similar to what people do today, actually, where in college, I actually did this entire like class on grass. Yep. And the nutrients in grass and how certain types of grass can just completely ruin your land. Yep. So if you want horses, you could plant a specific type of grass that would keep them healthy. And then, but it will also like drain the soil. Yes. And that's how you, you know, give your, but nowadays we have um, fertilizers. Yes. Back in the day, they did not. And nope. also I grew up on a farm. So we that's why do, they would rotate pastures for all these different things here where they would constantly yeah. move things around. Back home, we would do something like that. And then also we would slash and burn your, <laughs> It was, you know. No, that's one of the oldest things they would do. So when they were so, clearing out the forest for new farmland, they would slash and yeah, burn. That so was the idea. Yeah, so you plant like cucumbers in one field one year and then another plot of land, you do like watermelon or pumpkins, but you yep. wouldn't do it the exact same year because nope. they need to recuperate. The soil needs to recover, basically. Exactly. So what they would do here is that it would be like wheat, fallow, and then in the third one would be oats and beans. Which, and then they just switch it. And they would just keep on cycling between it. Yeah. But if they had four fields, they could have had two of those empty. So then they could just go back and forth. No, no, no. What they developed was that they realized that for nutritional content, you didn't have to leave anything fallow because what they would do is they would cycle between the different stuff that was growing stuff. So they would start growing like clover as an example and uh, and soybeans, different things like that. And because what would happen is they would like grow the beans and then they would just not actually harvest them. Because so they'd let it degrade and, degrade back into the and soil. create fertilizer. Oh, that's so smart. So that's the four field. Yes. Four field. And they would grow clover because the clover would then be used as animal feed, which allowed them to increase. Because what would happen is um, every year when you would have these these farmlands, these livestock, these different things, people would cull their herd at the end of the year with after harvest going into winter. Because, yes, they had feed. Yes, they were able to feed their animals, but not all of them. So if you had a herd of 100, you would cull. I don't know. I actually don't know the percentage of it. Maybe half of it. 
Half is a really know, that's probably high a big amount, But you would call the numbers to reduce the population. It would give you meat and other stuff that you had through the winter that would be prepared so people would have food. And then simultaneously, it would reduce the amount of animals that you would have to support during winter. Clover, what ended up happening is that as this new farming techniques developed, people were able to keep more and more animals, which made people wealthier because they could have more animals and didn't have to kill the population. So the herds got bigger. The only reason I say it's a really high number to kill 50%. Yes. Is oh, I'm sorry. When you have, say you have sheep. Okay. When we had sheep, you would need one ram. So one male and one male would fertilize the entire population. And each sheep would have one to three kids. Three was like two is average. Three was great. Very few actually had one and it'll be all from one ram. Yeah. And so they would greatly expand the population. But how many of those are male sheep? You wanted female sheep because then you could just keep it going. Yeah. And then the male sheep you'd have to sell because we don't, we need one. You or know? you'd call so if you them. kill 50%, that is so much. Yeah. Of your, you get what I'm saying? Well, if you, if you raised them, wouldn't you, like if you raised them all together and you sold some of the males, wouldn't you call the rest of the males to eat? Potentially? We wouldn't because my dad learned early on, I would not eat. So. We just sold them. Okay. We sell them all. Well, it's interesting. I don't know the exact percentage. I, that's probably something that I should have looked up for it, but that is what they would regularly do. Okay. That's, so that's the three field and the four field system. A little bit off topic, but We need topic, to put this picture up where you should put it. Uh, I should put it up on YouTube and I should also simultaneously put it in Patreon so people see what it is that I'm talking about. So in the 1300s, right, Europeans faced this constant threat of famine and mass starvation. Harvest had been poor and mass hunger was becoming a really serious danger from around uh, 1305 to 1314. And then in 1315 to 1322, you had famine, which devastated most of Europe. Spring and summer floods were leading to crop failures so that peasants had no surplus grain to sell at the market in the fall of 1315. And things were so bad in the winter of 1315 going into 1316 that all of the seed that the peasants had stored, you know, to use for harvest that next year. Or not to harvest, but like to plant, they had to eat it. Which meant that going into spring, when they would be planting, there was significantly less seed to plant to then harvest and repeat the same cycle. And you have to remember, you have to remember, agricultural land was producing less crops off of more seed by this time, more crop was failing, and now they had less of it to plant. So you can see the domino effect of it just keep on going. Each year would get worse and worse and worse. And if you had a bad year and there was an actual crop failure, no food. So this would take years to just really break. It took five years to break that kind of cycle. Making matters worse, there was a whole series of, uh, what's the word? Ep- epi- Epizootics? Ep- okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, the it's thing- basically diseases in animals. Yes, right? exactly. It's the diseases that would affect animals. So there was a whole series of diseases that was affecting livestock that destroyed a lot of Europe's livestock population, which means that there's even less animals to produce more food for the people that are left. It added to so many of the problems of agriculture, because what ended up happening is that as people had were starving, they were killing their draft animals. So the draft animals that were used for labor to help for the farms and because they were killing them, they had less farm animals to work the land to make more food, which just kept on repeating the cycle. Also, wouldn't they just have less meat? They'd have less dairy. Less meat, less dairy, less everything. Anything to kill for dairy and for meat. And they didn't have any cows for dairy. Correct. This is like the perfect storm and it's not yeah. a, you know. Exactly. Literally perfect storm because there were a lot of storms. There were a lot of storms that were affecting okay, this thing. So isn't this also around where there was like human diseases, like mass human diseases? Yes. Yeah. So they had animal epidemics. Yes. Human epidemics. Yes. I have ne- I, well, we haven't gotten in- decided, hey, I like we're just going to. Yeah. There were a series of illnesses, but the. Big illness had not happened yet at this point. It was coming, but it had not happened yet. We're going to get into that because that's a huge part of this. So the results of starvation were devastating, right? Tens of thousands of people simply starved to death. Epidemic illnesses would carry off tens of thousands more whose resistance to disease were completely weakened by hunger. And at least one in every 10 people in Europe would perish either from famine, from the epidemics, from anything over what happened from 1315 to 1316 in the next couple of years. Still, 
despite all of the death, the population of Europe still exceeded the agricultural capacity of its farmland. It was still too many people. So with demand high and grain supplies low, that meant that food prices soared. Although the wealthier people, the aristocracy, would continue to live in luxury and seldom went, you know, without, they weren't hungry. They're the aristocrats. Yeah. Is this just a tale as old as time? Literally a tale as old as time. They never have to worry about anything. Oh, yeah. Everybody else, though. Hunger Games. Oh, you know, when everyone else is losing their homes and the and the economy is crashing, don't worry. The wealthy people will just pull their money out and then invest it into stocks that are safe or buy up all the land that is now super cheap because people lost their houses, their cars and pretty much everything. Oh, I was talking to someone the other day about 401ks and they're like, yeah, the economy is really bad right now, but we don't have to worry. We're just going to invest in medical marijuana. Can I even say that on YouTube? Yeah. OK, I'm just and I'm like, OK, interesting concept. Ah. <laughs> Because this came up um, literally during a conversation about people not being able to invest in their 401ks. It was a long story. But. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's just what happens. Again, because as inflation. You said, yeah. And as you said, it's a tale as old as time. They're the people that are primarily going to. Well, they're primarily. They're not going to be affected to the same degree as other people are. That's just how it always ends up going. So for the poor, for the masses. Yeah, this this whole thing was still going to be a constant worry and an issue. And so it is into this mix of pain, suffering from famine and disease and all of this comes war. Which, as you can probably imagine, did not make things better because it brought a bunch of disease too. actually. Wait, no, 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 that is that's wrong. Um, Technically speaking, I'm going to sidetrack here for a moment, because although the disease was awful, we're talking about what happens here at this point is the Black Death, which killed so many people. That is just it, it, it killed a lot, like a lot of people, but it killed so many people that this meant that there were more resources for the people that were left behind. So after it actually passed, it was better for the people that survived as they had more resources. They had greater social mobility. There was actually it was much better for them. Horrible thing to really say, but that is the reality of it. That's the truth. You want to hear the worst thing Go for that it. I read on Twitter during Go for COVID? It. Go for it. They were like, oh, everyone who's old is dying off. So more social security for the rest of us. Woo-hoo! Oh, see, that it's terrible to say, but it's accurate. I'm yeah. No, it's it's terrible. I get that. But no, you don't. I'm sorry. No, this is not how that it's works. It's the same thing that happens in anyway, here. We should not have this debate. No, no, it, it's, it it's not a debate. I'm not talking about anything as a debate. It's literally one of those things that it ends up affecting everyone, that the, f- the fewer people there are, the less resources have to be shared around. And that's what happens in here in this time period. I know, but that's a horrible argument for anything. Oh, it's not. I'm not arguing for anything. I know, I, know, I get that. But that, that, that's what I'm saying. They were using it as like an argument. You shouldn't argue for people to die. That's and never a good was, thing. And also, I don't want to tell anyone what to think. So we're definitely editing all of this out. No hablo inglés. Oh, I will say this uh, if it, it is out. kept in, because I don't know. No hablo inglés. Uh, you really shouldn't base an argument off of wanting more people to die. That is not a well, good argument. Well, you don't want to tell them what to think, though, because... I don't want telling to. people to not want other people to die is is one of those things that I will keep on my list of like, hey, you probably shouldn't do that. I, I know, but I don't that. like to tell people what to think. You're right. Everyone's allowed to think what they want. I'm not here to tell them, hey, that's not cool. Yeah, you're allowed to think whatever you want. And I'm never going <laughs> to I'm not going to say don't do that. Much of late medieval politics at this time would revolve around a protracted series of conflicts between England and France. This is like the big thing that was going on in Western Europe at the time, which is remembered by a rather misleading name, the Hundred Years War from 1337 to 1453, which might confuse some of the people who listen to this because, no, it wasn't actually 100 years. It was more than that. But it also was not a hundred years of just straight war and conflict. In fact, there were a series of smaller wars and conflict in between that are lumped together in like a giant period. It's like saying the it would have been um, way cooler if it was a hundred years of war. Oh, it would be that would be horrible. I mean, it would be horrible, but it'd be way cooler. It also wouldn't be sustainable, which That's is actually true. one of the things that we're going to talk about in here for how why they, they couldn't re- do it. How did they repopulate their militaries? Because I was writing a story, which you don't need to worry about the details of this story. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Continue. But I was also trying to figure out 
the exact time period of generation. Like you'd have to time births and deaths perfectly to keep your army at max capacity at all times, which is impossible if you think about limitations of injuries on the battlefield, disease, and just general inability to create more children. There were truce periods. And also people back then were popping out way more children. I mean, I literally was sitting there trying to do the math on how many kids you can realistically get out of a population of like 500,000 every single year to repopulate their massive army. Don't write stories, you guys. It takes way too much. Hey, that, that's, that's part of it. It's part of it. It's just managing the logistics of it all and understanding. So the issue here between France and England with these two kingdoms is that they were sporadically at war. Sustained warfare, especially in medieval times here, is way too expensive to actually keep up. But the tensions between France and the English crown would go back centuries way before 1337 and would continue a long time after the war, all the way going into the early 20th century when the Germans finally became the big baddie that was going to replace France as England's big rival. <laughs> the big baddie. The big, I'm not kidding. No, that, I'm not. That is a really big thing. It ended up being a point where France and England were rivals really going all the you way into the 19th century. The superpower, but you chose the big baddie. Are we the baddies? In their eyes, that's what they said. It was a whole thing surrounding the German Navy because they didn't want Germany to rival Britain in terms of naval power because Germany was already the dominant land power as a as a military. So if they were also trying to challenge Britain's Navy, then this was something that they did not want to have. That was like Britain's one big thing that it could rely on to be able to maintain its colonial empire. They didn't want to have to also deal with that. It was, it, it's a big thing going into like the, the later half of the 19th century. It's a whole it's a whole thing there. So the root cause of all of this conflict can really be traced back to when William, the conqueror of England, who was William, the bastard of Normandy, went and conquered England in 1066 and introduced all of this whole stuff with like the French court into England and vice versa, introduced more of England to northwestern Europe. See, from this time, English monarchs would hold titles on both sides, right? We're getting a whole, whole issue when it comes to dynastic politics and what they would and what would happen. It's really messy because William the Bastard was Duke of Normandy, right? So he was a vassal of the King of France. But he was the Duke of Normandy, but also the King of England. So he was a king as well as a vassal technically by one of his titles to another king, which is going to create a whole series of conflicts between France and England. This is 100% giving the British Royal family is an actually British energy. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, they weren't for the longest time. Like, well, I know that now, but who would have thought? Yeah. So the inevitable result of that is friction, lots and lots of friction in which the royal family that was crowned in Westminster could also draw upon the economic resources of England in order to protect and enlarge their domains and interests in France, while the one that was crowned in Reims would try to assert their authority over the whole geographical region of France. So generations later, you have William's great grandson, Henry II of England, who ruled over more French territory than the actual king of Engl uh, king of France. Yes, the English monarch, who was a vassal, quote, to France, owned more of France than France did. That brings me to a very important question. I'm sure everyone has. Were the people that they ruled over OK with this? Like, could you imagine the king of you get what I'm saying? Hey, Gabby, for centuries. Well, how would did that work for stability? It wasn't until national the pride. It really wasn't going until like the late 14th century, early 15th century, I think. I think going into the 14th century that the royal family of England actually spoke English. I mean, they English were French. Is pretty, English is pretty hard. No, they spoke French. They considered themselves like French aristocracy. OK, I understand that. And I understand that they also didn't have really set lines because everything was constantly changing. But. How did that work for stability of a nation when your king was not even your nationality? Like there was no sense of like 
national pride. Why did people even sign up for the military? Well, they 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 were forced to via levies, but series of brutal crackdowns, among other things. Uh, I'll I'll give you this as an example. Remember Richard the Lionheart? We covered this back during the Crusades. Yeah. Yeah. He spent the majority of his life in France. He made a comment at one point, and this is a very common thing for English monarchs, that they preferred their French lands because better weather, more productive, more everything, more of the culture that they really wanted to be around, etc. Uh, yeah, he made a lot of remarks of like he would have he would have sold the English crown if he thought that he could find a buyer. I mean, I understand yes. that, but how does that help that their people? Who cares Did about nobody care? who cares about helping the people? They're, they're think, aristocrats. They answer, didn't care. This is my theory. To answer my own question, I personally think that people <laughs> didn't care about national. The king being English or French didn't matter to French or English people because. They were all the same. Quote. It was just a rich person who didn't give a shit. You were you were actually kind of close. Blood was way more important for like where your family line was tied to. So there was all kinds of different cases. I'll I give you this as an example. The common person who is starving to death cared what their blood was. So Gabby, when when Greece and this is a little side note for anyone, when Greece got free from the Ottoman Empire uh, in the 19th century, did, you know you know who was put in charge. No clue. A German. Like a Bavarian prince. Because he had Greek blood, right? No. What? No. You just said bloodlines are more important. Yes. That was a trick question. Yeah. And you should say, no, hey, because trick question. For the families, like in order to tie them to the other royal families, it was a it was a German prince that they put in charge. I wouldn't be okay with that. Personally. Yeah. I would not. There's okay all kinds that. of stories behind that, but we're getting a little bit off, yeah, off yeah. track from I'm this. I'm sorry. I just had to ask because this is convoluted. It is. Oh, it's going to get way more complicated. Just wait. We're getting into the Hundred Years War. You're going to want complicated. I say no one. You don't want complicated, but it's coming here anyway. That's exactly what's Which happening. Which chapter of the book is this? This is going throughout. Th- 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 this is this is going later into the book. Yeah, as it enters I'm on into like the Hundred Years. Chapter six, I think five. Just wait until it gets into the Hundred Years War. Uh, there's a lot of other information that we're going to pull from all I've this I've been listening here. to this for two weeks, but I don't have a lot of time. Yeah. So what ended up happening here, right, is that you had the grandson, Henry II, who ruled over more French territory, as I said, than the actual king of France did. But his descendants, his grandson, uh, are like the grandson of Philip, who was like the ruler of France. He reduced the English king's holdings down to only the duchy of Aquitaine, which was Gascony, which is the southwestern little segment of France right there above uh, right above Spain. And so one cause of the Hundred Years War was the feudal rights over control over Aquitaine because the English kings technically would owe homage for this territory to the French king. Isn't that word homage? Because you don't say the huh part. Homage. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I think you're right. Homage. Homage. Yeah. The, the idea of it is that it obligated one king to do homage to another. And that was seen as very insulting. Why are you laughing at me? <laughs> you're insulting me right now in the same way that these English kings would. I'm sorry. Just your accent. Homage. Should I do it like that? I don't know what the hell I'm doing at that point. See, the, the, the gist of it is that these kings did not like the fact that they had to pay homage to the French kings, but they really wanted to retain control over this territory because it was very valuable. The two largest sources of revenue of taxes for the English like monarchy was the wine trade of Aquitaine and also the wool exports of England to France. If they lost Gascony, if they lost Aquitaine, that would be a huge chunk of their revenue just gone, just gone that they would have no access to. The thing that really bothered them was that any of the local nobles that would rule different parts of France or sorry, rule parts like the like the lesser little territories inside of Gascony, inside of Aquitaine, they didn't. When there was a legal issue, they didn't really have to go to the king of England, who was their actual lord, because it was feudally within France. They could just go to the royal court in Paris and get it resolved that way. And naturally, the French king is going to be like, I'm going to take whatever decision is going to screw over the English the more. So they're going to do that, which really would piss them off. This is going to lead to a major power struggle between the two. The other issue was dynastic. because. 
any medieval power struggle, if we're talking about that, it's not just one of warfare and intrigue and other stuff like that. The whole thing is a massive game of complex marriages and and strategy. And if you've seen House of Dragon, you would understand that at some point, if you have two people who want their families to lead, they just marry their kids, even if they're half siblings. Yep. Right. Half siblings. Oh, the Habsburgs. If we go into the Habsburgs and what they did for dynastic. It was all about controlling power because, hey, if this person was, they had a claim to this land and this person had a claim to this land, they get married, even if they're related. And I mean, super related. Then we can combine the land and then that's more power. Within the family. Yeah. So, you know, keeping it within the family, just that's, that was the whole point. Sounds so wrong to say, but that is exactly what happened. Back in the day, it sounded better to be a little bit poor, not too poor, just poor enough. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what happened is the princes of great houses would marry within the same kind of limited circle so that Europe became a massive interconnected web of cousins, often with claims to each other's thrones and different titles. Which is just a recipe for disaster. So Louis VII of France and Henry II of England were a very powerful example because they married the same person. Not at the same time. I can see the look on your face. No, it is not the same time. How was I I was so worried. I was like, how is that allowed? Okay, continue. So it wasn't at the same time, right? But they both ended up marrying after when it didn't work out. So you had Eleanor of Aquitaine, one of the most powerful women in history, and they had both been married to her. But their successors would make an even bigger and more important match. Because in 1308, Philip IV of France was trying to ease tensions with England. So he wanted to ease tension with Edward Longshanks by arranging for his own daughter, Isabella, to be married to Prince Edward, who was the future Edward II of England. And at the time, no one thought that this was going to be any kind of issue, right? Because... There was plenty of heirs that would be able to serve the French crown so that there wasn't going to be a succession crisis. Definitely not going to happen. No one imagined that this wedding would actually lead to an English king that would have a claim to the French throne because Isabella had three brothers, all of which would be able to rule in case something happened to the king. So no issue. Nonetheless, that is exactly what happened. So at the reign, or rather the end of the reign of Philip IV of France, uh, France was by far the most populous, the most powerful, the most influential kingdom in Europe. You had the Holy Roman Empire, of course, but by this time, the Holy Roman Empire was starting to decentralize more. So France really was the most powerful. And by happy accident, since the days of Hugh Capet, or Capet, I think is how the French would do it. Capet? Maybe. It's an E.T., so I'm really leaning towards the E.T. Like a the cafe. So since the end of the cafe, right, you had there had always been a son to inherit the French throne. It was very clean, right? Philip's three sons were the kings of France in turn. You had Louis the Tenth, Philip the Fifth, Charles the Fourth, and Charles the Fourth had three times been married but had no son, only an infant daughter, which meant that the male line of the House of Cafe was now extinct. And there was no precedent for a female line succession to the French throne. There was no precedent for it, so they didn't want to do it, which meant that there was for the first time in like hundreds of years, a dynastic crisis in France. Really big deal. So now the choice of the rightful heir and what they were going to do was left to the great assembly of French nobles because they have to determine who's actually going to be in charge. This is literally just House of Dragons. L- welcome to dynastics. Like that that's literally what ends up happening here. They captured it really well with just how messy this stuff gets when it comes to blood because blood lines leads to bloodshed all the time. And by proximity of blood, the nearest male relative of the deceased king was actually Edward, the son of his sister, Isabella. But there was a bit of a an objection, logically speaking, to Edward going and inheriting the crown, because if the crown could not be inherited by a daughter, therefore, it would be inconsistent to give it to the son of the daughter, because if the rights didn't go to her, why would it go to her son? That is so logical. Yeah. So that that was the idea. At least they're consistent. Yeah, it was 
in they didn't want it to go something that could be potentially going through a woman in that scenario. Yet there wasn't even more. I, I know you're laughing, but that's the reality. Welcome to the medieval period. That's how I these hate, things work. I hate when we record the episodes because sometimes I'm bad at controlling my facial expressions. Oh, the facial expressions in here for anyone who's actually looking at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's the, your reactions are what I live for. It's one of the reasons why I love creating this stuff, because I'm telling you the story. I'm explaining the things to you and I love seeing you react to the stuff. So there was there was another issue with this. Edward was now Edward III of England. Moreover, he was 14 years old at this point. So not only would the line be going through his his mom, his mom but you'd have a 14 year old on the throne and the French didn't want that. This was also the point where his mother was the regent of the crown and she had recently deposed and murdered her husband, his father, the previous English king, along with her lover. They knew, Roger Mortimer. They, they knew she did this. Roger Mortimer was yes. her lover. Okay. Yes. That was it was it was a and huge she got away deal. with it. No. No, in the end she did not. But it was a this is what was happening at the time. There's a whole story behind that. We could probably do an episode dedicated to that whole scenario no. because First, it's a spicy I want the thing. Aquitaine lady, because if she is one of the most important Oh, Eleanor Aquitaine, women. yes, huge. Why haven't we done an episode huge. on her? That's huge. Yeah. But I also need to know about the murder. You can't just put that in there and then leave us hanging, please. We'll definitely get into that. I'll probably do a dedicated podcast that's dedicated to that, like, sure, because we want to get all the details and everything together for it. Okay. It's important that we get everything together. Uh, maybe we'll even do it as a patron exclusive to go into that, to get people to join. It's a little, little That side. is so mean. I know, I will but not it, allow it. Listen, I, I, I need the support, okay? Objection. Overruled. <laughs> So considering the circumstances, it's really not a surprise that the French assembly decides to award the crown to instead a more distant relation, but a person who is French. And that would be Philip the sixth Valois, who was descended from Philip the fourth's younger brother because he was an adult. He was the descent of an all male line and completely French. The decision was retroactively justified by something called the Salic Law, which stated that daughters cannot inherit land. So Philip VI was the first king of the Valois dynasty, and they would rule for quite a while. It was a very successful dynasty all the way from 1328 to 1589. This was a this was a cadet branch. So it was like a side branch that was still related to uh, the uh, the Capetians here. And they would rule rule France for the next two and a half centuries. Now, you may then wonder, okay, well, what is England going to do at this time? Well, they're dealing with their own kind of internal problems. And the English king goes initially and accepts the decision of the French assembly and even goes and pays homage to Philip VI for his French duchy that he controls. But the issue was that in recent years, that homage, that supplicating themselves before like the French rulers That had to be done every time a new ruler ascended the throne, and it strained relations each time it happened. So because Edward's father had to do homage to four different French kings while he was still ruling, in turn, each time he did it, he was getting angrier and angrier and angrier because it's embarrassing. It is. It's embarrassing to have to do. Exactly. So in 1329, the now 17-year-old Edward III attends a magnificent ceremony that is in the Amin's Cathedral, and he does homage, not as a vassal, but as a fellow monarch, dressed in crimson velvet robes, embroidered with the golden lions of England, wearing his crown, having a sword at his belt. He's not showing up as a vassal, right? He is showing up as a full-fledged equal, a monarch. And so during the next eight years, you would see this gradual change from symbolic defiance to just straight up open warfare between the two powers. One sore point as an example between them was Scotland. Always a massive sore point in the ass for England. Always. That is just how it's been throughout the entire history. The English king expected. I was going to mention Ireland. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Wales and other parts of The United Kingdom that England. I wasn't going to mention it, but you stopped. So I had to. Yeah. Well, I saw that you wanted to say something. So I I had to ask. See, the, the sore point that they had over Scotland was that the English king expected that he was going to have just free hand, be able to do what he wanted in the second war of Scottish independence. 
but the French king went and provided refuge for the boy king of Scotland, David II, Bruce, which was in accordance with the old alliance that they had. By 1336, both sides were pissed off and prepared for war. The final breach came from a rather trivial thing, though. See, in the midst of all the struggles that are going on in the early 1300s where people are suffering and there's plague and not exactly plague, but like famine and other epidemics and all the trouble or trouble with the common people. Uh, there was a minor thing that occurred where a French noble by the name of Robert of Artois was found guilty of criminal forgery in an attempt to try to claim an inheritance. So he goes and flees to England. And when Edward refuses to surrender this disgraced lord to French justice, Philip declares that he has forfeited his rights as a Duke of France to the Duchy of Aquitaine and goes to seize it because he has been disobedient. So Edward's response was then rather dramatic. He formally revives his claim to the French crown and declares war to claim the French throne because he declares that he is in fact the rightful king of France and that this guy has no right to tell him what he should be doing with his own duchy. Now, there is some historical debate here at this point as to whether Edward's claim to the French crown was actually genuine. Remember the whole Salic law and everything that was going on, or it could have just been a political ploy to try and get more people to his side because he's declaring war as a king of France, not as a duke of France. The idea of it is that In declaring that he is a king of France, he is legitimizing his actions to draw more people to his side as allies, because if he can turn more of the French vassals against the king of France and side with him, that will strengthen his position. It's it's actually a smart thing. It's not just he's trying to claim it as a power grab. It's specifically to weaken the opponent because it it makes it shaky. I understand. Like a civil war instead of a war by an outside power. It's just once you know what it leads to. (laughs) Yeah. Mess, lots and lots of mess. So here we go. We're getting into the conflict. And this is what all this has been leading to that leads to utter disaster. So hostilities in the Hundred Years War begins at sea, right? You have a fight for control of the English Channel. And at the time, neither kingdom had any kind of purpose built navy. Instead, what they relied on was refitted merchant vessels that were designed to raid coastal towns and shipping. Both of them sought to obtain war galleys from the Italian maritime republics, but Instead of them getting a lot of support, they more so stopped each other from receiving support from more outside power, so it kept it more localized. Meanwhile, Edward III of England's cause was strengthened with an outside independent power, which was Flanders, which is in Belgium, for anyone that's a bit confused. See, the Count of Flanders remained loyal to Philip VI of France, but in the cities... The anxiety of the people in it that relied on the English for their wool trade, because Flanders was like a massive cloth producing center. Like if you had a place, it's kind of like what would happen if um, imagine if Silicon Valley in in California decided to abandon the United States and side with, I don't know, China, because China is providing all of their rare resources that they need in order to produce tech. So they they revolted despite the orders of the actual ruler because they feared that if they did not side with England, they would lose access to literally everything that was driving their economy. So they revolted and this ended up leading to um, a rebel under Jacob von Artevelt or Artevelt Artevelt. I believe it's Artevelt. A rebellion, right? Yeah. So it's a rebellion under this guy, Jacob de Artevelt. And Edward would personally go to Ghent, which is in Flanders in 1338, to assume the royal title of King of France, which allows this rebel who declares himself to then be like the new Count of Flanders to swear his allegiance to the true King of France. So you see where this is going now to turn the vassals against the king and try and build up a power base. That's where we're going. So. He then goes to ship his army to Flanders, which then prompts the first major confrontation in the war, the naval battle of Sluice, 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 Sluice. Somebody help him! Sluice, S-L-U-Y-S, Sluice. Words 
are hard. I believe it's least. I actually can't remember the pronunciation for how it's called, but it's the first naval battle that occurs in hit. I say naval battle. But it's not like what we think of it today. I know. I'm like, what do you mean a naval battle? What did they throw at each other? Exactly. Arrows? Yes. But it was more about ramming your ships into other ships and turning it into a land battle on sea. Here's here's how it works. Oh, so they jumped from one ship to the other ship. Kind of. Kind of. Kind of. Kind of. There's all different kinds of boarding mechanisms that they would have. They boarded the other ship and then just started fighting. So it's like the Viking experience in Savannah. Yeah. So when we were there. Ah, that was terrifying. I hated that. Yeah. So what would happen is these naval battles were not like what we would see today. A medieval naval battle would resemble a land battle just on the ocean. The ships would close in on one another uh, while they were exchanging arrow fire to, you know, try and whittle down or weaken the opponent. And then they would grapple together, push together. The troops would jump from one side onto another. And what would you would see is a desperate, bloody fight to try and take over the enemy ship on the wooden deck. So the French had this 230 strong fleet that was a very significant size that assumed a defensive formation that was linked by chains. So in order to stop the English from approaching, they linked all of their ships together by chains near the port of Sluis in order to prevent the English from landing. Now, they thought this was a good idea, but the Genoese uh, mercenaries that they had hired to serve with them, there was this guy called Pietro uh, Barbavera. Who was telling them like, no, guys, 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 please don't do this. It is stupid. You are going to get destroyed. But the French dismissed him because he was a freaking commoner. Well, how dare he tell great French nobles how it is that they should be conducting warfare? Obviously. What are you uh, like from a place that perfectly understands naval warfare at this time? Because that's literally all that you people do as a trade port city. What? No. We're not going to listen to you, you moron. So, yeah, they go and um, they go and dismiss it. And the English fleet maneuver in and they go, we're not going to attack you. They sit there. They wait. They wait for more favorable winds. They wait for the tides. And with that delay, what ends up happening is that all of these French ships that are chained together start to drift. And as they're drifting and the chains are moving on the ships, it's starting to entangle and wrap them all up together to the point that they literally cannot move. So they defeated themselves. They defeated themselves. Love that for them. And in this into this disorganized state, the English finally attack. Okay, I just want to say that, you know, the naval battle we were talking about where people are on ships. If you want to experience that. What did we do in VR? It was the Viking experience in Stavanger. Yeah, and it was in VR and it was terrifying because the arrows were like flying by your face and I had to close my eyes the entire time. <laughs> it's worth it. It's cool stuff when they have the stuff that's recreated now. I would love to see this though, like a, like a recreation of it because they, they did it very smart. The English were, it wasn't the English Navy at this time, but they were still more experienced with naval warfare than the French were. Absolutely so. So what they did is they attacked in units of three. Two ships would, that were carrying archers would move in and they would have one that was full of men at arms, like melee fighters, the guys who were going to jump in and get to the dirty parts. With limited maneuverability, the French ships really couldn't do anything, so they would be isolated, targeted, boarded, and captured. The archers would move in, pepper them from both sides to weaken the, the opponents that were on deck, and then once they were sufficiently weakened, because they couldn't move because they were all chained together and couldn't get out of there, then the men-at-arms would just jump in, board the ship, and just mock up, or like mop up any of the survivors and just clear them out. I was like, they could probably stand a decent chance if the archers didn't take them out, like man to man, maybe man to man. But even then they wouldn't be able to maneuver. So if you just wrecked the ships and then it dragged down the other ships, because think about this. Well, can they jump to the ship that wrecked them? If they're close but enough, you can just won, go that way. You could be like, let's go if they won. But it's the English and the English at the time are famous for their archers. Like it's a really big deal. It's what they were really known for. I was they, really rooting for the French. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's not going to work out for a large part of this here. So it becomes very clear that things are starting to go towards the English. The Flemish allies that they have then sail out of their ports and attack the French from the rear. In total, out of the 230 ships they had, the French lost 190 ships. So like 80% of their entire Navy that they built. And then also 16,000 men. Now, strategically, this battle was not really necessarily is. I believe it's not necessarily well known in history. It's not like one of the big naval battles. 
But this was a huge and important opening battle because what this meant is that by destroying the French Navy and them having no real way to raid or do as much across the English Channel for the opening start of the Hundred Years War, this meant that the war was going to be fought on French soil. Oh, the that's English, not good. Because the English had control of the channel. Now, you say it's not good. It definitely wasn't good for the peasants. And we're going to really well, get into that. Obviously, if you're here's the thing. When you're fighting a war, if the war is fought in your land, it's going to get destroyed. Everyone who lives there is going to be screwed. There's no agriculture because you can't farm. It will get destroyed because yep. they'll see it. Hey, oh, logistically, you're, you're already should, predicting this and I love it. I mean, I listen to most of the book. Also, I do read a lot. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, what would you destroy? You destroy everything, everything that is, you know, important. Yes. Necessary. Yes. It actually covers this in the beginning. So the like the first chapter of the book when it's talking about um, we're going to cover it. Chavoche here. If you remember that from the uh, the French were already doing it to them like themselves between the nobles. But um, the English took it up a notch here for this war to just do whatever they could. I think it followed the house of Cousy, the Cousy. Cousy's. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because they were doing it to their neighbors. The neighbors were doing it to them. It was a very common thing. We're going to get into that. So you think from the beginning, OK, major victory, right? That must must mean that things are going to go smoothly for the English now, right? Sure. As we cover in this podcast, whenever I say that things are going to go great I now, mean, no. right? No, there you go. So Edward III was really unable to follow up on his victory at Sluis for essentially six years. Nothing really major would be able to happen. The cost of the war and what this was doing to England was huge. And there really was no benefit that they were getting out of this. Public opinion was turning against him. He had no money to do anything uh, for his continental cause. And eventually, in order to try and recover financially, he just ends up defaulting on his debts to the Italian bankers that were funding him, which reduced the Bardi and the Peruzzi houses like these big. These are the big Italian bankers. They go completely bankrupt in the process. Is this the guy who did the stuff to the Templars? No, because I know the book goes over the Templars as well. I'm forgetting now. I don't know either. I'm forgetting. It. Well, remember how we had the Medici? Remember how we've looked at the Medici before? We have, yeah. So the collapse of these two families is what allows the Medici to rise to power because okay. these two families are the dominant ones that are really in control of a lot of the parts of finances. And we're. I only asked that because I do remember the book going over the Templars and the trial of the Templars and exactly what occurred there because it might have I'm drawing a, a blank now money. and because he couldn't pay on the debt he was like okay uh, I'm just gonna take you out that was with the French so okay. the, the for the French were the ones that uh were getting like loans from the Templars that okay. was them okay these are the families that funded the English so everyone was just funded by someone wealthier kind of yes okay so I'm gonna need to, a little sidetrack note we're gonna need to talk about finances sorry I just very, I mean, no it's very important. It's, important it's very important so we have to understand this I, I'm pretty sure that I mentioned this before but medieval banking is a very broken dumb process because, because Christianity they didn't allow loans like you couldn't be a banker yes but you needed bankers to fund anything exactly so Christianity and also nobility really screwed with stuff for the longest time because with increased economic activity in the medieval age, there was a growing need for money exchange for loans, for conversions of coins, etc. And money changers were very soon holding and transferring large sums of money over different cities and different periods as empires and things were expanding and they were extending loans to merchants as well as nobles. And as the demand increased, so would the number of services. Common financial activities came to include the granting of loans, investing, depositing, credit, transfer functions, all the different things that you would have of a modern bank. Like that's the entire purpose. But a major obstacle to the growth of banks in the medieval period was the church's prohibition on like usury. The, it's not that the church didn't allow loans. It was that church did not allow interest on loans right, you couldn't so loan someone a thousand gold pieces and have them pay you back 1100 so basically it wasn't against loans it was against banking because that is banking yeah you could still bank but you weren't allowed to collect interest so people had all these convoluted ways that they would get interest on stuff that wasn't actually interest so you weren't paid back with money you would pay with collateral so what happened is like this was a huge thing in the in the um uh, when people were loaning money to like the 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 emperor of the holy roman empire and whatnot 
you would give money to a noble family in exchange for letting the merchant use their land for like if they owned a mine, like let's say it was on a land, they would get all rights and access to that mine for three years or whatever. So it's not a, it's not interest. It's they're transferring ownership temporarily to extract the profits from it. And that's one of the ways that they did it. And if it just so happened that that merchant is, you know, better at managing finances than a frickin noble who is only thinking of war and not usually finances, the merchant would make a lot more money than the noble did because they actually understood how to run a business. That's usually how that would work. Loaning money was still very dangerous. It was very risky. There was no way to ensure you'd get it back. Someone could just say, I'm not going to pay you back. I'll kill you instead. Yeah. So what happened is that as economic activity expanded, the papacy started to change its opinions and became to insist that interest needed to be paid on investments that were made at risk, like ones that were actually risky, you know, versus just standard little gift loans, such as in the case of a war or something else, because people were forbidden from getting interest. This meant that a lot of the early banking and loans and merchants and different groups that were doing this were typically coming Jewish from people. Jews. Yes. Yeah, the Jewish people. So th- this is a little bit of a side note. When people talk about like that, that stereotype and really um, like racist thing of Jews and money lenders and controlling all the finances, that was real. It wasn't real from um, like people actually controlling stuff. It was real from you had actual Jewish banks and families that were funding things because they were the only ones that because of the church that was oppressing them that they were allowed to do. So it it was this gap that these well-educated people were able to step in. But then once the church goes and sees how powerful they're becoming, the church starts changing their opinion on it. And allowing people to do more, which meant that they could expel the Jews and instead have their own people run this. And this meant that banks were operating stuff from these families that a lot of these families were tied to the church. It's crazy. So, okay, so that's happening. And like the um, the international luxury trade, like where a lot of the stuff is going through is based in Rome, you know, where the Catholic Church is during the medieval period. And so by the end of the 13th century, the Florentines, as the papal treasurers, the tax collectors, all these people, they spur Florence to become the banking center of Europe. Right. And large numbers of families would go and invest their capital in different commercial and industrial developments. And so in the 1290s, the Bardi and the Peruzzi family, the guys that we just talked about, they had established branches in England and were the main European bankers, like the really big banking families by the 1320s. And so the greatest danger to medieval banking was granting loans to European monarchs to finance wars. <laughs> because the use of mercenary armies and field artillery really increased the cost of any kind of military operation. It made it way more expensive. So to finance these activities, rulers would often try to repay loans. They would get these loans on the condition that they would pay back at very high interest rates. We're talking 40, 50, 60 percent rates, which you got to think about it. You know how some super predatory credit card companies are like 28 percent interest? I've quite literally never heard about 28 percent. No, some of them are. I like you've seen these small cards. I like I've seen some that are like for like five hundred dollars. And so five hundred dollars at 28 percent interest. Yeah, that's bad. But it's not like. A, a lot because 28% of a hundred dollars would be $28. So it's like a hundred something extra dollars. If you're getting enough money to finance a war and you have a 40 or 50 or 60% interest rate, that is really bad. Okay. So, you know, when you're playing your EU for a multiplayer campaign yes. and everybody takes all those massive loans and then they're like, oh, just don't pay back your loans when you're like bankrupt. Yeah. This makes a lot more sense now. Yeah. It gets really bad here. So they would, they would take out these ridiculous loans, but if they were unable to pay back their loans, they, they just, just didn't. didn't. They just literally <laughs> didn't. They would just refuse. Like most of the bank failures, like when these huge banks would fail in the medieval period of the Renaissance, it literally came from nobles just going, yeah, no, I'm not going to pay you. It's the 
like nobles were the housing market of people just not paying their mortgages in in the medieval period, except it was people not paying for the war that they caused. Talk about lack of personal responsibility. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, that, it, it would be bad. So that is what happened to these guys that went and funded England to in order to launch their stuff into the war for the Hundred Years War. So I, I, I had to go on that little side note here for the uh, for the for the whole finance aspect of it, because it's just it's it's so sad and hilarious it's crucial to me too, to understanding exactly how they afforded all of this nonsense. Oh, yeah, exactly. It's so stupid. So Philip the sixth, right? He he's still at this point now in a fairly good position. He's in a commanding position. He has greater resources than the king of England, and this allows him to rebuild a kind of modest French navy that allowed him to start raiding the French coast again within a year. So it wasn't going to be something that was decisive, but he could create a lot of problems on the English home front. In the meanwhile, England was unable to keep fighting on the French soil. Or sorry, not unable. They were able to keep fighting on French soil by intervening in something that was called the War of the Breton Succession, because you know how um, France and the top left of it, well, on the western side, you know how it has that appendage that kind of sticks out into the English Channel up. It almost looks like Florida, but it's sticking out on the northwest part of, of France. Yeah, their little tail, but it's like, yeah, that's so strange. that's that's Brittany. That, that, that little region is Brittany here. And there was a whole diff, there was a whole succession crisis in it where the English and the French kings were backing a different person to the succession of that territory, which would go on for two decades. And in the end, the English backed claimant would win. So in 1346, Edward had managed to recover financially from his, you know, escapades earlier and decides to mount another major offensive. He sails for Normandy with around 15,000 men and he starts on a brutal campaign of Chavoche. I love that he recovered and he was like, you know what we should do to celebrate war. (laughs) Welcome to the medieval period. (laughs) Yes, that works. Yes, yes. Everyone is miserable. So Chavoche, and it goes heavily into this in the initial parts of the books. And I love when it was talking about it. For anyone who doesn't know what that is, these are fast mounted raids all across France that are designed not to attack military targets, but to instead pillage, burn and destroy every single possible thing that could potentially make money along the path. Anything that could provide a resource. The, the whole purpose is to destroy rather than actually take any kind of territory. I get that, but that's just going to affect the common people yes. way more than it will affect. Yes, that's the purpose. But the common people were not controlled. They were not calling the shots. Yes. I don't understand. But the common people are the one that are paying the taxes and supplying the grain and all the other resources that the nobles are using to fight the war. So if you take away the, the resources... You take away the peasants that are serving as troops. You kill all the people that are paying all the money. Then there's nothing to support the French. Continue. <laughs> yes. So this is where he, this is so stupid. And it, it's, it's smart. It's smart, but terrible, but stupid. It, it's, it's the whole thing. So this would be a very char- like a very common tactic that the English would use throughout the entirety of the Hundred Years War. It was used repeatedly. And mind you, people, it's not just the English that were doing this. The French had been doing this to each other for centuries prior because it wasn't until a couple hundred years later that the French crown would actually be an absolute monarchy and control France I think, like in an iron grip. Before this, it was a very decentralized society where the lords of France controlled their lands in France more than the king did way more. So these nobles were constantly fighting each other and raiding each other's territory and doing the exact same thing to each other. It was very common for these nobles to be burning the ground of the other noble while also both had allegiance to the king of France. They were like little countries in and of themselves. Very common. So I remember that from exactly. So the English are just doing the same thing that they were already doing. The purpose of this was to terrorize, demoralize the people and to drain French financial resources. Also to to discredit the king, because per the feudal contract, the king was supposed to support and protect his people. That's the idea. The nobles participated in war while the common people worked in order to like so the nobles would protect them. 
That's that's the purpose. That is the entire point of the feudal contract was that someone else was doing the fighting and the dying. That was the whole point. I do. I do appreciate. OK, so one thing I know a lot about is feudalism mm -hmm. because every single history class, it fascinated me. Like, why? Why would you work for someone instead of trying to be powerful yourself? I don't know. As a kid, I was obsessed with being the Lord. Yeah. And I was okay. so confused. Okay. <laughs> Listen, hear me out. I was so confused as to why anybody would just work for that guy. Like, are, you're going to do that for free? I mean, obviously it wasn't for free. It was for protection and whatnot. But really, I was like, I want I want to be the guy. Feudalism was a giant extortion racket. It was literally an extortion <laughs> racket. That's that's that is the purpose of it. It was I trussed up be, with fancy words, but it was an extortion. I racket. I want to be the big wig in the extortion <laughs> racket. Yeah, of course you do. Everyone. <laughs> I was like eight years old. Okay, <laughs> homeschool. Long story. Homeschool history class. Being like, why would you be peasant? Who is making this decision? <laughs> Just just simply pick yourself up by your bootstraps and become a noble. Damn it, Literally, just do it. get a horse, get a ginormous sword and get out there. Get out there, pal. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, HRL me had no concept of social constructs. OK. <laughs> so the whole point is to, you know, discredit the king and do all this other stuff. And so you have the city of Cayenne or Cyan, Cayenne. I think I think it's Cayenne. This is a city that is larger than any in England, except for London. It's taken completely by surprise. It's looted of anything that is possibly portal, any uh, portable, anything that is not bolted to the ground. The English either take or burn and a bunch of nobles are taken for ransom. Almost half the population was killed and at least five. That was at least 5000 defenders and civilians. Edward then goes and marches to within 20 miles of Paris before withdrawing and taking him uh, and his soldiers and heading towards his allies that were in Flanders with Philip's army in hot pursuit because Philip's army is bigger. The entire purpose of this is to try to draw the French out to actually do something and make their lives miserable. Eventually, though, Edward finds himself outmaneuvered. He's caught and he is forced to stand and fight at the Battle of Crecy. In August, I know I saw your look because I've covered this several times. This is one of my favorite battles in 1346. I, I, I'm serious. I love this battle so much that this was the focus of the thesis that I did in college. And the focus of every single drunken lecture. Yes. You give to me. I love it. it it's, for it's, free, by the way. I don't have to pay for this. Lucky it, me. The, the whole premise for anyone that's still a little bit curious about this, the thesis that I did is that I was talking about the developments, like really where the hallmark, the beginning of the professionalization of armies, like the transition from the medieval period into more modern warfare, like the developments of military technology over the Hundred Years War. This is the battle that was like the, the hallmark of it, like the, the, the beginning of it. This is what I loved. So next time you talk about your thesis, I should explain it because, because I've told I told you so at many this times point in time. I, I should get like one point, no, like 0.5% <laughs> of your degree. Like half of it you give to me, half of it you keep for yourself because at this point I've done the thesis too. Yeah. So next time I explain it just so I can feel, get my no, feel free. Do it. I, I, I'd love to. Not right now. Thank you. Okay. I have to study. Yeah. Okay. Well, here, here's the first part of the lesson here. So I can explain it to anyone that's, uh, that's listening or watching right now. So, so here's what happens. The English go and take up a defensive position on a hill. They take their dismounted knights to fight side by side along with the common born archers and the infantry behind trenches and stakes that are designed to slow down the enemy cavalry because the French are like they're the biggest component of their army. I say the biggest, the most important component of their army is their knights. France is famous for its heavily armored noble knights. It's a huge thing. They had developed these kinds of tactics during the wars with Scotland, and this proved devastating against Scottish charges at the Battle of Falkirk, which was in 1298. So Philip's army shows up. It's much bigger. That's what she said. <laughs> but they're really tired. They've been marching the entire time trying to catch the English army. They are exhausted from the march. But despite this, they are so confident and eager for blood that they decide to launch an all out attack as soon as they come across Edward's position. Because Edward was trapped here. 
And here's the dumb thing. Here's the dumb thing. If they had stopped, if they had waited, they would have easily won. Easily. The French could have easily won this because the English were trapped in enemy territory. They were low on supplies. They could have very easily been starved into submission. The longer that the French waited, the weaker the English were going to become. But they wanted blood now. And so as a result of that, the battle began first with a direct skirmish between the English longbowmen and the French crossbowmen, because the French had hired a whole bunch of Genoese crossbowmen to serve as their mercenaries because they didn't really have many ranged troops. So hiring crossbows was like one of the most common things that medieval armies would do for like mercenary men. You had spearmen and crossbows and crossbows were like the big common thing that people did. But the English were up on a hill. And the slope, along with the fact that it had just had a brief but intense rain, meant that their weapons weren't functioning very well. They didn't have the range or the impact to actually really hit the English. So when the English started raining fire way more quickly, way more accurately, and at way further range than the crossbowmen could reach, it was... They they had the longbow. They had the longbow. It was an immediate route, essentially. So the Genoese start to retreat, and this hisses off the French so much seeing these weak commoners retreat from battle, these stupid cowards that they decide to launch an impromptu cavalry charge into their own men. They like the crossbowmen are still retreating. And rather than waiting for the crossbowmen to get behind so that then they can move forward, they're like, nah, screw that. Screw these guys. Ride them down. So the French knights charge into the middle of their own crossbowmen. They're hacking and slashing at all these weak, stupid commoners that dare to get in their way. And it just creates this mass of men and horses that they're all kind of stuck in. And so the longbowmen looking at this are like, huh? That is a very big and easy target. So they just fire into it again and again and again. And because of that mass, the English, the, the, the French charge, instead of being one really big charge, end up breaking apart into groups of smaller charges that they keep on coming across. So it's like small groups of cavalry rushing the hill time and time again, all getting focused by archers at each point. At no point did I think maybe we should stop. Several times, also, but it, it didn't work. I have to ask, is the Battle of Cressy, Cressy mm-hmm. the paper we have framed? Yes. Okay, so we actually framed his it's senior thesis. Here. It's not in here. We have it in a storage box right now because you didn't want to put it up. That's true. But we have this thesis framed. So if you guys want to hear it, he can probably just do an entire podcast where he <laughs> reads the paper to you. Let us know if you want to hear that. So... Again and again and again, the French heavy cavalry thunder up the slope, facing barrages of English arrows. By the time they reached the Englishmen at arms, the charges had lost most of their energy and were ended up getting repulsed by the hand to hand combat of these dismounted knights that are up on a hill with stakes. So the, the horses are charging into stakes and then you have English knights that have spears and long like pole arms and they're just hooking the English knights, dragging them off their horses and then just beating them to death Wait, as they fall English- off. Yeah, because they dismounted them on the hill for a defensive position. They're not they're not on their horses because they're maintaining their own defensive line. That was that was the whole point of it. Oh, I didn't put my mic up to my mouth when I talked just now. Ah, It's fine. No, it's not. Sorry. Sorry. So the what what ends up happening is that you have 13 charges with only one of them being any kind of serious threat at all. Finally, in the late afternoon with the French tiring Edward goes and orders his own heavy cavalry forward, effectively ending the entire thing. The French king fought valiantly and two horses that he had been riding ended up getting cut down from under him. But he had to abandon the field, leaving at least 4000 French dead, including 1500 knights. Okay, so wouldn't people specifically just target the king? Yes. That was so, the point. You wanted to capture him for ransom. And did it was a he huge have deal. people protecting him? How yes. did he survive two horses being cut down? Well, because you'd have the bodyguards that would get him out of there and they would, you know, you charge, retreat, counter charge. Like that was the whole point to do it again, because the greatest strength of cavalry was in the charge. Once you were caught in melee, it was very easy to pull someone off a horse. You had to stay mobile because if you weren't mobile, you were caught. You were trapped. Oh, I want to play fact, Total War so and, bad. Yes, I know. In fact, they, OK, here's a detail about this battle. It's my favorite fun fact from all of this. One of the nobles that died in this 
was King John of Bohemia, right? He was known as King John the Blind because he was literally blind. But he ended up leading one of the French charges. He was literally strapped to his horse, like tied to his horse with his lance and everything prepared. And then his retainers around him are like, "Okay, well, we need to protect the king. We're his bodyguards. We can't let him just go down. So they tie their horses to his horse so that it's one big charge. Now, here's the here's the problem with uh, with with horses that are getting fired at by arrows. They run. They run. So if one horse in that entire line gets downed by arrows. You know what happens for the rest of them? It's kind of like what happens if you have a boat and you throw an anchor off the side of it while the, the speedboat is moving at high speeds. Was and he thrown? The whole thing. He reaches in. He actually makes it to the English line, starts fighting valiantly, and then just all his retainers get pulled down. He get pulled down, killed. Why did they let their blind king? Honor. Oh, I'm not honor. The answer literally for honor. He could have just not done that. He could have not, but it was his duty. It was his honor. He was his purpose. How was it his honor? He was already king. That that was the point. He had to show his his skill, his bravado, his heroism. That was the whole point. That was the idea behind nobility. And it was really one of the things that we that we would cover in this. It really in the book. Remember how it covers like the whole thing behind nobles and like why they fought so much, because that was literally all that they would be ever know like that was their point that was their purpose was to fight that was a really big component of like the first couple chapters i think so yes but also i just fully don't understand they ha- okay i understand it didn't make as much money as they wanted to because merchants could make more so obviously they had to fight more to earn their name but <laughs> yeah i mean i get it but at the cost of death yeah yeah, that, that's what would happen. That's what, in fact, what was it? The, I think it was in the Kusi. The guy, someone bragged about like how his father, his grandfather, like each one before him, not a single one had died old in their bed. They all died on the field of battle. Yeah. yeah. Like th- that. that's the point. That's the purpose. That's the idea of being a noble. That's what you want. You want to die in battle. Yes. That literally, that was their part of their purpose. Good for them. Good for well, them. That was part of their purpose. Good for them. So this was a huge victory from the English. It, it, it was just a massive victory for them. It was a it was a hallmark. Swinging. What was the word? It's like the swan song of chivalry for medieval Europe. It was a death throw. It was a big cry. This was the beginning of a transition in military trends that would continue over the course of the next centuries as cavalry would gradually lose their place as the dominant thing on the battlefield. Nobles would lose more of their power. This battle was so devastating for the French because remember how I said 1500 knights? A duke could be a knight. A count could be a knight. The lowest level horseman who had literally just a horse and a sword could be a knight. That that term is for anyone as a mounted soldier, essentially. This battle killed so much of the French nobility. That the people that were running the country, like it just ended it. Imagine if ev- almost imagine if half the bureaucrats in like every single city in the country that operate things just died. Also, women weren't allowed to do anything. Yeah. So they left all of their wives and kids. Yes. Behind. Yes. So their really young sons had to now take charge. Yes. You can see how this is a bit of a recipe for disaster that would lead to further degradation within the country. I personally think Sparta was onto something when they let the women have an ounce of power, but that's yeah. just me. No, it's, it's, it's the that's whole point. That's awful. So yes. France just came crumbling down. It didn't, but it did. It, how did this it go on it, for a hundred years? Because there France were cycles. Was that week. We're going to get into it. There's a whole period. The Black Death is a huge oh, part of this. Look at that yes. homie helping them out. Kind of. Yeah. We're, so we're, we're going to explain this because that's like the last component of this um, that, that I wanted to cover, because, again, there's still so much information. So it would take the French a long time to learn from their losses here in the beginning and what really happened. It was a great victory, but this did not divert Edward III from his plans. He still continued on his goal north and besieged Calais. And although the citizens did resist him for almost a year, it finally capitulated in August of 1347. And that city would remain in English control even after the Hundred Years War all the way until 1558. So they would control that for over 200 more years. 
after the fall of Calais, when both sides had bled out and were in essentially financial ruin at this point, again, they signed a truce. This truce would be held for several years in large part because there was a more serious thing that was threatening them. The Black Death. Neither side could really fight at this point because disease started to ruin them. And this is the thing that would really suck. As we talked about earlier, around 1300, there was a slow decline in population that had began in Europe. With the end of the so-called medieval warm period, there was a series of cooling periods. You had local famines that began to appear more and more, along with unusually severe winters, as well as rainy summers that would be very disastrous, like we talked about in the beginning, from 1315 through 1317, which resulted in the Great Famine. With grain failing to mature, flooding from the rains, destroying crop fields, and a pestilence that would kill a lot of, like, the cattle, like the cattle livestock, that would just lead to a massive series of combined famines and diseases that would wipe out around 10% of Europe's population. So these crop failures would last all the way until the summer harvest of 1317, and Europe did not fully recover until 1322. Then in the 1330s, there was an unusually strong strain of plague that appeared in China. It seems to have elements that were both bubonic, and mnemonic, which for anyone who is not familiar with the terms of what this is, there were there was technically two types of different things when it came to the plague. People always refer to it as the bubonic plague, but the bubonic plague refers to like when it would create the boils, yeah, the the boils, boils on and the, the pus- body. Yes. But then mnemonic. So there was also a respiratory illness. Yes. So it could be transferred either by fleas and things that would bite and physically or transfer direct it contact. or direct contact. But then there were also variants that were spread by respiratory respiratory breath. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So the death toll in China, we literally have no way to estimate what it actually was. Is it because there was something else happening? There was other stuff going on. Everything is always going on in China at this time. We've covered all this death and destruction that was going on in Europe. But this is happening everywhere. Can we pretty please do another episode on the exact time period in Asia? Yes, we can. Because this time period was during the collapse of the Mongol Yuan dynasty and the rise of the Ming dynasty. And when there is a collapse in Chinese dynasties, literally tens of millions of people die. Every single time, without fail, millions of people die. That is always what happens. And so from the origin of the eastern end of the Silk Road, the Black Death would travel along it, reaching eventually the west through the trade routes. And at this time, travel was easier than ever before under the Mongols because they were policing the entire area, which allowed trade to flourish. So the Black Death first gets reported in the city of Kaffa, which is in Crimea, in 1346. And then from there, the Genoese merchants that were operating in the area bring it home in Europe. At least that is the common theory carried by fleas that were on the back of rats that were seeking or that were seeking that were taking passage on those merchant ships. So this thing begins to spread around all the ports of the Mediterranean from 1347 to 1348 and places like Egypt are struck severely. Then the plague starts to move northwards from Italy. It reaches France, Spain, Portugal, England, all by June of 1348. By uh, then you have Germany, Scotland and Scandinavia that eventually get touched by around 1350. And it eventually reaches Russia in 1351. So over the course of around three to four years, the plague starts spreading all across Europe. And it's bad. It's bad. They had no choice, though. No, like they had to keep trade going to keep, you know, society flourishing. They had absolutely no. They can just shut down. They could. They could. And in some places they did. Some places they didn't. Here's the thing. How would they shut down? They needed that trade for a lot of things. They would shut down when they would die. Okay, yeah. But I mean, like a shutdown, like what we did for COVID. Yeah, no, they literally could not do that because farmers had to farm. Merchants had to. People would be quarantined. There were things where like no one was allowed to move. Essentially, no one was allowed to move or do anything. They were quarantined in the sense of like serfs being essentially chained to their homes. Almost. You're joking. Not not physically. chained. I'm talking about serfs already were bound to the land. So if people tried to move or escape or flee, that could be punishable by death in some places because they were trying to trap all of it. 
This is before germ theory. This is before all of it. So no one really knows how the stuff is going about and doing anything. In fact, they believe that is a that the plague is a curse by God in many places like that. That's that's how it would operate. So you have these different people that are writing about their experiences. And one of them is this contemporary uh, Sienese chronicler, which Siena is one of the uh, the cities there that is in Italy, one of the little city states. So it's Agnolo di Tura del Grasso. And he describes this, that what would happen first is that the victim would start to experience flu like symptoms. Then they would see a swelling beneath their armpits and in their groins as these bubos, these boils would start to appear. And then death would shortly follow. Agnolo himself would actually bury all five of his children while he was still alive with his own hands and lose his wife. He was the only one that would actually see it through while everyone around him would die. And this was very, very common. The plague hit hard. It hit fast. People would feel fine one day, maybe a little bit ill for just around two or three days, and then just die. They were gone. The person who may have been just feeling fine one day was then dead the next. This was a very common thing that people would, would write down and cite. So there was this guy who was a uh, of this French chronicler, a guy called Jean de Vinette. And so he was in Picardy in France, and he witnessed the disease take place in northern France. Normandy, as an example, lost 70 to 80 percent of its entire population. Italy was equally devastated, with some cities losing up to 90 percent of their population. Some cities were arguably wiped off the map completely. You had this Florentine author by the name of Boccaccio who recounts that the city citizens would dig these massive graves in a kind of trench in which they would just pile the corpses into as they would arrive by the hundreds. I'm sorry, this is making me so sad. Oh, it's, yeah. But I do remember one chapter of the book where they spoke about motherhood in this era yeah. where there was not much about motherhood. Yeah. Because they didn't know if when they had a kid, they had so many kids, first of all. And second of all, they had so many kids and so many kids died. The infant mortality rate was insane. Yes, it was already high from the beginning. It so just got astronomically higher. There weren't. You know how today we're like, motherhood is so hard. Like we have like two kids, three kids, four kids, one kid, whatever. It's difficult. Yes. And so there's a lot of literature about being a mom and being a mom is like praised. But back then there was nothing written about moms being attached to their children. Because they would have, they would go through preg pregnancy is awful. I've done it. I mean, it's, 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 it's awful for some people. It's tough and easy for others. It's complicated. Yes. But there's a million things, no matter what your experience with motherhood is, you can find someone who shared that experience. They yep. did not talk about it. And like, it goes over this in the book where like these moms would have kids and there's nothing about motherhood. There's not childcare. It was assumed that moms just knew how to take care of the kids there was no like bond with their children and they don't know if it's because it just wasn't written down because no one was writing it down or if it's because moms just were not connected to their children because children died so quickly. Yeah. I don't know. This is just like, you know, it, it's adding to that fact yes. where they're like, oh, everybody died. So like it doesn't matter what anybody did. There's no point in getting attached because literally, you're more likely to bury them anyway. Literally. And obviously they had so many children that it just it. It didn't matter after a certain point. I mean, if you had like 10 children and three lived, you'd be like, good job. You lived. Yep. They're still likely to die by 30 anyway or something. Yeah. There had yeah. to be like a disconnect. Yep. And that, yeah. That, I mean, it, this really explains why. Yep. So like the authors would literally write that um, they would dig this massive trench in which they would lay the corpses in the same way as a, you, a merchant would pile merchandise onto a ship just stacks upon stacks upon stacks of dead bodies. And that's what it is that you would do. There really was no universal pattern. Like you, you had some cities that barely saw like 10 or 20% of their population die. And then you would have others that would kill again, 90% of it. Europe as a whole lost approximately 25%, maybe even a third of its population, maybe, maybe around 20 or 30 million of its 80 million people, cities and towns where people lived like cheek to cheek, just where they were connected, where it was so closely quartered and cramped. These places were hit especially hard. Toulouse in France was a city of around 30,000 in 1335. 
A hundred years later, only 8,000 people lived there. Florence lost at least 60% of its population. Hamburg and Bremen, around the same. Paris and London lost around half of its population. And this wasn't just one thing. People talk about the Black Death. It was the Black Deaths. It was multiple waves of the plague. This would come back time and time and time again. And it was it was something that would literally stick with Europe for 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 decades. It wasn't just one black death. It was like multiple waves of the black death. And it just it it sucked. This would continue all the way until I think the last out, big outbreak would occur in Marseille in France in 1720. Like they still had waves of like the same thing. Now, they were not as bad with time because people would actually get resistance to it. Like the population that would survive would become more resistant to the next wave, but that is what would happen. And the once all of this happened, like the initial big wave that killed off so many people, malnutrition slowed birth rates. So population growth was very slow to pick up, at least initially. It would take around 150 years for Europe to recover to its pre-plague levels of population, like by 1500. For like a century and a half, there would be less people than there were because it just there was so much wanton death and destruction. It was bad. So did the entire Hundred Years War go on like a little bit of a break? No, it would still occur. Remember how so I they're said- dying from the Black Death, they're dying from yes. malnutrition. Yes. And they're like, die. Yes. So the because remember, it would come in waves. So you'd so have, every time there was a lull, they'd be like, you know, what would be great if we killed each war. other. Exactly. Like, yeah, th- that would happen. The disease has paused. Time for death. Yes. Yes. So all, all this stuff would be happening. The pandemic ended up, as we said, killing around half of Europe's population. It didn't matter how wealthy you were. It didn't matter how uh, like how high your social standing was. It didn't matter how religious you were. None of this stuff mattered. You all were going to die. Do you remember the Edgar Allan Poe story? Was it Edgar Allan Poe? For which With one? The, um, it was like a party and it was a masquerade ball. Mm-hmm. And the Black Death started. Am I mad? Did I dream this? I don't remember. I, you might. You might be. I don't know. I, I actually don't swear, know. There's like an Edgar Allan Poe or some other story. Where Maybe someone in the comments of YouTube would be able to tell us. I don't remember. Party and the masquerade is going on. And then they hear like, you know, the plague is here. Hmm. You don't remember that? No. I'll, I'll be honest. Okay, I wasn't, you continue. I'm going to look at it. Other than the classic, I swear it's real. Other than the classic stuff that we would cover in like the English classes when looking at, uh, you know, the poetry or the short stories or the other stuff. I didn't really care about any of the stuff. That just wasn't a thing that I was into. So I, I don't know. Maybe it was something that you covered that I didn't, but I'm, I'm not sure myself. People were. Distraught. It was bad. With so many people dead and dying, the patterns that really kept medieval society stable completely broke down. It was replaced by hostility, by confusion, by greed, abuse. And it was just bad. Okay, it is real. It's called the Mask of the Red Death. And it was to develop the theme that wealth and privilege do not make people immune to death because all of these rich, wealthy people were partying while this plague was going around. And I I think it applies. Yes. No, no, they would. And people would just die. Like this whole thing was was terrible. Everything was breaking down in society as this was going on. So writers like contemporary chronicles or chroniclers would talk about just these periods where there would be just eruptions of violence. Christians were going around massacring Jewish people in Germany and other parts of the world wherever Jews lived. Thousands of people were burned indiscriminately because the, the, like this was a ritualized form of attack because people were blaming Jews as like the scapegoats of what like they were the cause of it. Do they do that every time something bad happens? Yes. Everyone always looks for someone to blame during a time of crisis. That and is, they just choose. They were one group. It was a very easy target for people. That to very blame. specific group. It was a very easy target for people to, uh, to, to blame. Right. Constant scapegoats. Yeah. Yeah. So there was this idea that Jewish people were poisoning wells and that was the cause of the because uh, there was the whole before germ theory. It was miasma. I know. But how did they explain when Jewish people died of the like they did it to themselves because they're evil beings. And they just widely accepted that theory and yes, kept on- yes, it was easy for them to blame people. Yeah. Welcome to history. It sucks. A lot of things suck. That is literally history. This is my judgment face. Yes. I'm judging. 
I hate to judge, but I have to. Wait, that's your normal face for me on a daily basis. I wouldn't do that if I were you. <laughs> so it was bad, right? And um, some Christians became more pious. Some lost their faith completely. But the people that became more pious, they believed that through piety that, and endearing themselves to God or some kind of entity that they believed that this plague was something that was sent to punish them for their sins and that if they believed hard enough that it would just go away. There were texts from this time that would describe all of these penitent pilgrims that would be walking through the streets, flagellating themselves with whips and other stuff like making themselves bleed like they'd be walking through the streets holding whips that have spikes and like twisted nails and bits attached to them. So, and they're flagellating themselves in public as they walk down. Do you know in the Old Testament where something tragic would happen and they would rip their clothes, cover themselves in dirt, and like mourn? Yes. 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 I've taken a lot of Old Testament, New Testament, foundations of Christian thought, foundations of Christian belief, Christian belief class. I went to Christian college. Um, I've also grew up really religious. So yep. a lot of this is, I mean, yeah. So they would crowd the roads together, you know, a perfect time for gathering of people in the middle of a pandemic for diseases to spread even more. So you can imagine it didn't work. Others would react very differently instead turning to a no holds bar free for all every person for themselves whatever they would give themselves over to completely to pleasure right because the world's ending anyway why that don't we just also, become hedonistic assholes that's also awful because then they're just yes they're touching more people yes during a pandemic yes yeah <laughs> understand what's happening here nobody knew what to do i understand nope. like if you have no better thought you're like you have no idea what's happening the world is ending might as well go out with a bang Literally, for many of them, a lot of bang, a lot of banging. I actually would rather side with the people who are flagellating themselves than this. Yeah. But that's just me. So there were the, all these records of people describing uh, monks, priests, nuns, people of the clergy, all these these people who were the pillars of society holding it together, just giving themselves over to pleasure and to enrich themselves because nothing mattered anyway. I'm so happy for them. Look at them living their lives. Yeah. Uh, quote. <clears throat> They lay and enjoyed themselves at will. Everyone thought themselves rich because they had escaped and regained the world. At least according to Agnolo, that guy who, you know, lost all of his children and everyone. Oh, I still feel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he wrote about a lot of the stuff because it was recounting the death and destruction and suffering that everyone was going through. It, it really is not surprising that when you look at it, like what we just described here, that in this age of disaster this complete collapse that you would see all of these social economic political and religious consequences and changes that would occur both in the short term and the long term and this is really important because it's because of these things right that you would see all of these developments in the later centuries as europeans were succumbing in huge numbers in extreme cases it would create a kind of collective hysteria that would break out. And this is where they looked for the scapegoat. Scapegoat, exactly. And they were like, oh, the Jewish people are poisoning our wells. Yep, yep. I so, mean, I guess they had no better explanation for it. They no. didn't know science. They didn't understand anything. They just... Nope. So all across Europe, there'd be these pogroms that were aimed at Jews and a common expression and search would go out where they were looking for a scapegoat by people because they didn't really understand science exactly as you said they didn't understand proper medicine they didn't understand disease they didn't understand how things transferred and so there were these rumors that were going around saying that these wells were being like poisoned by jewish people in an effort to like because remember these were the bankers these were like the financial people they were trying to kill people off in order to seize their wealth and create destruction because they were agents of the devil so here's the thing you saw during our most recent pandemic yep. that a lot of people actually didn't understand what was happening. And I fully understand that. I mean, science it's, it's complex. And As like, a laboratory scientist and you're talking about this. Yes. Yeah. So I fully understand, you know, kind of what they felt, I guess, where even in modern day where we have all of the education and all of the resources, it's complex and it's not widely available. We love to preach, I think, in the U.S. that everybody can, it, science is accessible. And I think science in the United States and a lot of other countries where they want to believe science is accessible, it's not actually accessible. 
it's not as easily understandable as you think it is. Yeah. Because as a biologist, I would sit there reading like, well, first of all, if you can get to a journal article that is free, good for you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Behind, locked behind the paywall. Good for you. And that that's where the information is. That's where the peer reviewed studies are. That's where what is going to explain what the vaccine and how it was developed and the 20 plus years of research that went into it. They're all behind these massive paywalls. Yeah. And I don't mean to go off on this like tangent, but I have to because everyone is like, oh, science is easily accessible. You should be able to understand it. But I think during the entire ordeal, a lot of the time I would just spend my time trying to explain to everyone exactly what was happening because I at least knew and I had the resources where I can understand what was going on. But the general population had absolutely no clue. They did not know how that vaccine was developed. They did not know what was happening with the virus. They did not understand the science behind it because where is the science? It's behind these massive paywalls because science is not as accessible as people want it to be. Good because rant, first of, actually. Well, no, first no, of no, all, it's actually good. It's a good point. First of all, you took biology in the U.S. When I took biology in not the U.S., we actually learned biology mm -hmm. in the U.S. They dumb it down to the point where people can pass. In college, the general biology classes dumbed down because everyone was like passing notes. Nobody understood what was going on. And like to some extent, people do it to themselves where they don't actually apply themselves to learn what is being taught. But also... It's not as accessible as everyone wants it to seem like we want to create this utopia where we're like, everybody is fully capable of understanding if they want to. But have you ever read a scientific research publication? Yes, it sucks. To this day, I'm I've, I'm a published scientist. It is hard. <laughs> like I'm writing something right now and I'm like, how do I make this sound super smart? Because I like to write things and explain things and I really like person to person i dumb everything down because it's easier for me to process like i do with history you do with science to for people. me to communicate like i i enjoy explaining things to people in a way that they can understand and now i'm I, i've written the entire introduction of this research like paper and now i have to make it sound smart <laughs> so aka i have to make it inaccessible to someone who doesn't understand the jargon of my field Anyway, I'm done. Thank you so you much know, that for listening to this friend. For all of sorry for hijacking your podcast. Re no, remember when we did the episode here on um like the tin can sailors and there was all those insulting people in the comments that were calling you stupid on YouTube and the other stuff. And it's like I literally have to explain this. My wife is a scientist. Like she she has studied and done this stuff in depth for years. She is a peer reviewed published author. She she is very good at what she does. She just doesn't have nearly as much knowledge for the stuff of history, which is why I explain I the stories. And then I get lost as she's explaining some well, of the stuff to me. I also don't have the pizzazz. I think a lot of what you have is you have the flair. You have the ability to take no information and make it amazing. Like you can expand upon two words. I'm the opposite. I can take 50 words and make it two words. For anyone who is listening to the podcast, not seeing on YouTube, uh, I have a very smirk look on my but face no, right now. That's like the Smug. difference between a historian and a scientist is like, I can take a lot of information and like condense it down and he can take no information and expand upon it. <laughs> so he's like the storyteller and I'm just like the practical thinker. So I think, you know, it is what... <laughs> It's we, what we do. We've gone a little bit into a tangent for it. I'm because sorry, just, you said plague and I said, hold up. Yes. I'm uh, so sorry. I'm so sorry. So back to the Jewish people getting massacred. Um, that was not a good segue. I know, but that's exactly what happens, right? Um, the first of these occurs in uh, Toulon in France in April of 1348. And the situation rapidly worsened when a Jewish doctor that was in Ch uh, Chilon in Switzerland was tortured into confessing. Uh, Basel then burned all of its 600 Jews later that month. And the hysteria spread during 1349 with shocking massacres that would occur all over the place. Strasbourg, Mainz, Cologne, all in the territories in the Holy Roman Empire that is today uh, like Germany. And it's, it was bad. By 1351, there had been 60 major and 150 smaller Jewish communities destroyed, just completely wiped out. This is what happens when people don't understand yep. what is happening. And so naturally, a whole bunch of people are not going to stay there. They're not going to stay where they're being persecuted and people start to flee. 
So the European Jewish population starts to make its way to different places that will accept them. One of the big was places was in Poland, where Casimir III offered them protection and allowed them to settle in large numbers. You ever wondered why there was such a large population of Jews in Eastern Europe going into like the 19th and 20th century? Now we know. Now you know. So all of that stuff that was happening with the Nazis and they were like taking all the Jewish population that was in Eastern Europe and how they had such large populations there. Yeah, that would, literally came from centuries earlier of people migrating there. Wasn't it because of a Jewish mistress? Yes. So the, the theory behind it is uh, that Casimir wanted two things. One was because he had a Jewish mistress as he was a bit of a ladies man. And, uh, you know, felt bad for him. And so he wanted to bring people in. The more practical reason, though, was because Jewish families were, on average, significantly better educated. They had skilled trades. They had all these valuable things that Poland, which admittedly at this time was more of a backwards kingdom in comparison to the rest of Europe, it wanted to bring people in to elevate its status. So to develop it further. So they wanted that. It's, it's it's both a smarter move practically and also as a humanitarian thing to do. So that's what they did. Meanwhile, for the Christian population, the plague struck the church of it very hard. Clergymen were contracting the plague because they, on average, were the doctors that were tending to people. It was usually members of the church unless it was like private health care for like an individual doctor of like medical families. So while they were tending to the sick and the dying and giving their last rites, they were contracting the plague, which then led to a severe shortage of priests in the aftermath of this. Now, while the eventually the clergy members would be replaced with new ones, these new people in the Wait. clergy were very oftentimes hastily trained and had no understanding of what it was that they okay, were talking so about. I definitely remember this part of the book because yes. she was talking about all of these people doing their rites, their initiation into the clergy, not understanding Latin. So these people would be conducting their like uh, religious rites. And they have no idea they what just the hell make they're doing. Up. So this one guy, I, I don't remember exactly what it was he was doing, but he said, oh, he couldn't pronounce it. So he just made up a word and said, this is the word. And they just all went on with it. Like they just continued on like nothing happened because they did not understand Latin. They did not know what they were saying. Yep. They had they were just making stuff up, like fake it till we make it. Yes. And that is very bad when it comes to the church. I mean, it went on. I mean, once it started there, it just kept on going. Yeah, because it then, then the next level of people that are being trained are also being trained wrong. And then people die off and then it gets even a worse level. Because of training. if you've ever taken Latin, it's difficult, man. Yep, I understand. So so in the 15th century, there became significantly more common regular complaints about the decline in quality of clerical discipline because those members of the clergy of an parish priests were simply just like going through the motions in mass because they had no idea what the hell they were doing. Oftentimes they didn't understand what the words that they were saying meant if they were even saying it correctly, which is one of the things that would lead to the Protestant Reformation. Because, again, people didn't understand what they were doing. They the were just making quality, stuff up. Yeah. So you had corruption with the church. People who were literally did not know what they were doing as priests who were just shoehorned in the, into the position because they had to be. And then, obviously, if you're shoehorned into a position you're not well trained for, you would find a way to make a self-interested money grab. Yeah. Also, the people that were being put into the church were like the third and fourth sons of nobles and families. So it's like that's how you would go up the ladder because the church was ridiculously wealthy. Ridiculously. So in order to get more power, you would want a family member in the church. We should actually do a podcast episode, A, on Jewish people throughout history and B, on just the development of the church and oh, yeah. nobility. Oh, there's a lot of stuff we can do for that. fight amongst, you know, should we recognize the king? Should we recognize the pope? That is something we should definitely cover because yes. I literally will look things up like, hey, People would listen to the Pope before the, they listen to the King most of the time. Why can I not remember the name of it? But there was that the whole conflict between the papal and the imperial forces. It was an investiture. It was the investiture controversy. It yes, it is that controversy. But I can't remember the name of the two groups and what it was called. I did see the Giblings and the Guelphs, the Giblings and the Guelphs. Those were the two groups. Yep, that's what it was. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely cover that in the future. But now I, we've all just talked about horrible things. 
this is the end of it. This is going to be like the, the last part of the podcast because oh I know God, this has been going two on. Hours this has been going again. on for a very long time. Um, the peasants that survived, everything wasn't all that bad from the Black Death because the ones who did survive did see their situation improve. They had more food. There was more resources. Land became more available and plentiful for them. Nutrition would improve because so many people died that farmland disappeared like that land that was really bad quality because it was being continuously farmed again and again and again. Well, the farmers all died off. No one was tilling the land. So the farmland went back to being pasture. So it didn't lie fallow for one year. It would lie fallow for decades, which allowed the nutrients to gradually come back into the land again. And with pasture, that means that you now have cattle on it. The cattle are depositing their cow pies, which in turn is restoring like with a fertilizer. It's, it's, it's becoming better again. So the land starts to get better. But then above all of that, the most important thing is that serfdom, the the idea of peasants being tied to the land that they're working on, not being allowed to leave. That goes away because peasants. Were more valuable. They they before were tied to the land. They were essentially owned by the tenants of or they were owned as tenants of that land where they were bound to the landlord who would own that plot of land and would pay rent in the form of uh, like crops. But now they would actually be like renters who would pay cash to their landlords, landlords who would need that cash instead of just labor or agricultural products like they did before. OK, so. If this is like the 1500s, I guess, and feudalism is going away. 1300s going into the 1400s. How did pre-Renaissance. it go on for so long in Russia? Russia didn't see nearly the same level of destruction. The plague was bad, but it was way worse in Western Europe than it was in the I East. I don't remember the uh, literary work that I read, but it went on for a while. Like they still had duels and everything. Yeah. Um, we can go to a whole thing on Russian 18th, history here. 19th century. I don't know. It was really late where they yeah. still had lords and like serfs. Yes. Serfdom still existed. For yes. Going into the 1800s. Yes. In Russia. Yes. How were they shielded so greatly from all of this? They didn't this? see nearly the same level of destruction. So, so here, here's the issue. Because I know it happen. hit them last. Like you even listed it off. It yes. hit Crimea. It hit everywhere else. Population China, not Russia. way more spread out. They may have a huge amount of land, but their cities were much smaller on average. And people were way more spread out. Did so, we look at temperatures in like Russia versus the others? Did that have anything to do? Did I think know? it also had a factor because people were not mingled. They didn't have the big metropolitan industrial centers. They, they didn't have it. So the population being significantly more spread out, people being more further apart then the way the plague that would hit them wouldn't hit them nearly as badly. It's just it wouldn't last. Plus, with the creatures, the rats, Lice and yes, mice it, and it's not please. going to survive in the please. in the temperature to nearly the same degree. It's also the reason why, as you head further south going into Africa, it didn't do well in hot climates either because the bacteria would not survive. So it had a very specific temperature. The temperate climate was the perfect place for it to breed. That was the perfect place for it. We should also do an episode on serfdom in Russia. Yes, agreed. Because that was fascinating. I read about yes. it in like. Actually, English English literature class. Yes. It was very good. So, so many people die that what ends up happening is that in Western Europe, the people that are left are able to demand higher wages. They're able to demand better terms. They leave their lands and they go to better lords that are offering better terms, pay less taxes, pay less everything. So they're able to make significantly more money. The privileged, the privileged classes like the nobility, the merchants, the clergy, they seeing that, OK, shoot, the common people are now like rising up and getting more power. Uh, this is bad. They're getting way more wealth. They start using their political power to try to reverse those trends, oftentimes by force and issuing sumptuary laws. Your favorite section of the book here from all of this. Sumptuary laws are so good can you imagine telling people what they can buy where do yes so the, the the stuff in the beginning is like the most basic stuff that you would expect right uh they tried to stop workers from relocating you know keep them tied to the land didn't really work very well uh they tried to force wages to say the same couldn't really do that because people would still just up and leave and go to places where they could make more money where they could get better terms 
the one that they really were able to kind of do, and this is where you saw it everywhere, was in the sumptuary part, the consumption of goods. They would stop people from wearing certain things or only being allowed to wear or use or eat certain things. Are only allowed to earn like three outfits, four outfits, one outfit, like yes. one fine outfit. I mean, like a really fancy one because they couldn't dress like their social betters. What? No, no, no. There is no reason that this peasant, this stupid merchant should be able to have more wealth and nice things than this knight who has been serving the king for literally centuries with his family. But but that, that's the that's the part of the problem. And it goes into this in the book. Knights and these nobles were tied to the land. They legally were not allowed to work professions. The moment that a knight stopped to work his own farmland, he lost the privilege of being a knight. You weren't allowed. You had to have servants working it for you. If you didn't, you were no longer a knight. So the merchants who were actually doing their own work, they were doing all this stuff. They were getting people to work under them. They were making businesses. They were doing all this stuff. They led by example. They, not only did they lead by example, but because they were personally involved in all of it and managing things, they made significantly more money because they were actually working. They weren't dedicating their stuff to war. It was, well, some would because they would eventually buy noble titles. And that's a whole other section that was in the book that was really cool for how it covered it. That, that's just what you would see with the development over time. The efforts to try and control the population would lead to a series of revolts, peasant rebellions, like you had the English Peasants Revolt of 1381, uh, the Jackery rev uh, Revolt in, uh, in France in like 1358, and a lot more. The gist of it is that life would change dramatically as oftentimes does over the course of a crisis. There would be many more changes, many more events, many more things that would occur over the course of the 14th century. And we've covered a good amount, but there is way, 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 way more in the book. So if you want to find that out, then you need to get it. This month's audiobook, A Distant Mirror, link of which is in the comments. Again, and I get, description. I would yes, love description, to go sorry. into every aspect of the book, but as I said before, I've been listening to this book for what? Two to three weeks. Two to three weeks now, I think. I'm on chapter five. Yep. I mean, I'm not that... It, it's 28 hours of You are still working your regular job, to be fair. You're not dedicated well, entirely to, to this. in between, like, work. So yes. I, yeah. So, it's, it's a good book. It is a very good book. And I think every chapter, every... I have I haven't had one boring part of the book. I've had boring parts of lots of books, but not this one. Like it's just entertaining. It's a great story. It's new information. It's really specific, detailed information because they follow just like one family where they try to give, you know, context to the entire time. And I think that's so important because you can just name these great kings and you can name these poor people, but you can't get the level of context without yes. that much detail. And this book gives all of it to you. So if you want to have all this semi-useful, I want to say mostly useless information for modern day society, you should definitely get the book. It's fun though. It's fun You'll though. You'll have all the fun facts. Exactly. It's incredibly fun. I'm going to be making a lot of shorts and a lot of content that's dedicated around this because it's still just so great. And again, I could go on about this for essentially forever, but we've been recording- It's been two hours. Yeah, and 10 minutes. over- the thing is, because of the pauses and the other stuff that we had in here in between cutting, it definitely is going to be a little bit beyond that because we have to cut down and remove the other stuff. But it's still going to be around a two hour podcast, at least. That's a lot. Uh, thank you to everyone who has listened. I was going to go into a, a relative story, but considering the fact that this podcast has already been going on for two hours and we were exhausted and freezing in the garage and need to get food. I think we're going to go ahead and end it now. But so make that we can sure go inside. to send in your family histories to work with Stekui at gmail.com or go to history of everything podcast.com to submit your own family story. If you want to be featured in the podcast, support our Patreon, check us out on YouTube. Links for everything are in the descriptions. I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much for listening. And yeah, goodbye, guys. Bye.